Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me now. We, I welcome you all on this webinar on the topic I laughed so hard that tears rolled down my legs. The problem of urinary incontinence. We are also live streaming this webinar on our YouTube channel because we received more than 1,000 registrations. And in order to accompany all our attendees, this webinar is also being live streamed there. A few things that I would like to tell all our attendees today. If you have any question throughout the webinar, please ask it in the Q&A section. <coughs> During the webinar, there will be some polls that will be carried out. I request all the attendees to answer that. And those who are seeing our webinar on YouTube will be able to see the question on their screen and they can give their answers in the live chat. I am all today. I welcome you all on this webinar. I am also pleased to announce that there is another webinar by Dr. Deepak Kumar day after tomorrow on the topic manual therapy of the sacroiliac joint. I'll be sharing the link with that link of that with all the attendees as well. With this, I would like to welcome our moderator for the day, Dr. Adya Kumar, Director and Senior Physiotherapist, Kepri Institute of Manual Therapy. I request Dr. Adya to please start her video. Thank you, Tanmo. So, on behalf of Kepri Institute of Manual Therapy, I, Dr. Adya Kumar, Director, Kepri Institute of Manual Therapy, welcome you all to this webinar on I laughed so hard that tears rolled down my legs, the problem of urinary incontinence. Let me introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Snigda Mehta, a well-known personality in the field of physiotherapy, especially in women's health. She is a practicing physiotherapist for over 40 years. She is certified by American Physical Therapy Association Academy of Pelvic Physical Therapy in Advanced Techniques in Labor Support from Baltimore, USA, Fundamental and Advanced Pregnancy and Postpartum Physical Therapy from Houston, and also in Pelvic Health Physical Therapy Level 1 in Continent, Level 2 Pelvic Pain, and Level 3 bowel dysfunction from New York as well as Portland. She's also received training from the pioneer of women's health, Ms. Elizabeth Nobel. She's delivered numerous lectures on women's health nationally as well as internationally. With so many accolades to her name, I welcome you, ma'am, to this webinar on urinary incontinence. Over to you, ma'am, and welcome you to this webinar. Looking forward to a great learning art. Ma'am, would you please um, click on your video? Yeah. Welcome, ma'am. Over to you. Uh, hello, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Adya, for such a lovely introduction. She is uh, now uh, getting into uh, women's health, and she's really doing very well for herself. Uh, and soon she is going to probably overtake her dad. So <laughs> I would be happy because her dad has no limits. Her dad is just flying with better and better work. So um, I, uh, I will begin with my slides. So let me just share screen. Come on.
Okay, so yes, we are going to talk about the problem of urinary incontinence. The way things are going now, there could be more people wearing adult diapers than baby diapers by 2030. In fact, that's a very sad thing to happen, but that seems to be the future now. Urinary incontinence is widespread, affecting millions of women and men all over the world. Yet, it is the least reported and treated medical problem because 43% of affected women considered urinary incontinence as a normal part of a woman's life. It's a silent and hidden epidemic. Whereas Western world's ratio is one is to three, that means one in three women have urinary incontinence. The incidence of urinary incontinence in females in the island of Borneo in Malaysia is one in hundred. Hundred women out of hundred women, only one gets urinary incontinence. So what is the secret? In Borneo, every female is taught pelvic floor exercises before marriage and has to be certified for a tight vaginal squeeze around the finger of the midwife soon after childbirth. The women of Borneo know that urinary incontinence is not an after effect of childbirth, menopause, and aging. Another confusion that is shared often by in the minds of women is because pelvic floor is shared by different medical specialities who, uh, and they don't know where to go. These women uh, are confused whether they should go to a gastroenterologist, a colorectal surgeon, a gynecologist, a nephrologist, a urologist, or a physiotherapist. So they really don't know where to go. Actually, prevention and treatment of pelvic floor dysfunction should be a multidisciplinary field in which every medical speciality, including physiotherapists, should together play its own evidence-based role for the highest benefit of the patients. All of us have heard of the word Kegel exercise. Many have probably tried it too, but, but many have succeeded and many have not succeeded in dealing with the problem of incontinence after doing these exercises. Not any fault of Dr. Arnold Kegel. In fact, he is regarded as the founding father of non-invasive treatment plan for urinary incontinence. And he treated hundreds and thousands of women and save them from the torture of this urinary incontinence. So what is the main reason for Kegel exercise to fail? Because the only reason is we do it wrong. Also, now because of extensive research and advanced technology, we know much more about the pelvic floor than Dr. Kegel knew in his days. Now pelvic floor training is an important specialization even in the field of physiotherapy. So the first question on the screen, which is or are okay, so I think you can read them. I, I want the answers, please. So the poll is launched for all the attendees. The attendees will be having 30 seconds to answer the poll. The people who are seeing us on YouTube can see the question on the screen and can answer on the live chat. Another five seconds for the attendees to answer. Ma'am, you'll be able to see the results on your screen. Yes, all of the above is the perfect answer. And most of you have said that 51% yes. Uh, uh, all of the above muscles are the, are the ones that we activate too much while doing a Kegel. And that's why it's not a pure, correct 
pelvic floor exercise. Let's have a look at the female pelvic anatomy. So you see the pelvic floor. It looks almost like a little bag where we are putting all the goodies, the way we carry our uh, sabji or our fruits every day from the market. And poor pelvic floor has to do this work every single day of our life. So it's not sure whether it can hold on to this burden of the stomach, the liver, the intestine, the bladder, the kidneys, the uterus, etc., etc., forever. Pelvic floor muscles are extraordinary muscles. Not only do they do this support task, but they do a whole lot of things. They prevent urinary incontinence, they prevent fecal incontinence, they allow voiding, childbirth, sexual function, they, uh, they contribute to pelvic stability, lumbar stability, and are a very important part of the breathing process that we do normally. So there are three types of urinary incontinence that are the most common. The stress urinary con incontinence, where there's loss of urine with physical exertion, like laughing, uh, coughing, running, lifting heavy weights, and the urge urinary incontinence is loss of urine with the urge to go to the restroom uh, uh, very frequently, or you want to run to the restroom. And the mixed urinary incontinence is loss of urine with both effort and or with urgency. So that's the other question on the board now. The poll is now launched. 30 seconds for all the attendees to answer the poll. I request all the attendees to answer the poll. Please select the option. Do not send your answers in the chat. Five more seconds for the attendees to answer. Ma'am, the results would be on your screen now. Great, I think we have a great audience. The perfect answer is interplay of muscles, connective tissue and nerves. Yeah, I'm so happy to have such a lovely audience in front of me. So yes, continence does depend on neural coordination of activity between the bladder, the urethra, and the pelvic floor muscles. As the bladder begins to fill with urine, bladder pressure is low and the detrusor or the bladder muscle is relaxed. As more urine is stored, bladder outlet resistance must increase to maintain con continence. Okay, another question. Yeah, I think I've flooded you with questions and with such an intelligent audience, I would love, uh, you know, to give these questions to them. The question is in front of all the attendees. The question is, the levator and I muscles are made up of 70% fast twitch fibers, 30% slow twitch fibers, 70% slow twitch fibers, or 50% slow twitch and 50% fast twitch fibers. Another 10 seconds for the attendees to answer the poll. Ma'am, the results should be on your screen now. Okay. Uh, the correct answer is 70% slow twitch fibers. That's the correct answer. Great. So levator ani muscles are the group of deeper pelvic floor <clears throat> muscles. They comprise 70% of slow twitch and 30% fast twitch muscle fibers. They are in constant state of activity and resting tone. 
They can contract or narrow the urogenital hiatus. I'm not going into detailed anatomy because of a short time, but uh, uh, the uh, figure above shows where the urogenital hiatus is. It draws the urethra, vagina, and rectum towards the pubic symphysis. Liberty and I muscles provide active support against intra-abdominal pressure. So when the intra-abdominal pressure increases for some reason, lifting a heavy weight, if the pelvic floor muscles or the liver tannin muscles are, are in active and normal, they will prevent any leakage happening. They also act as postural stabilizers, contracting prior to movements to assist in core stabilization. They can be voluntarily contracted as originally described by Arnold Kegel. Full relaxation occurs during defecation, voiding, and parturition. Let's examine the pelvic floor. So uh, there's an official statement by the Academic of uh, Pelvic Physical Therapy, American Physical Therapy Association, which says that examination of pelvic floor muscles is consistent with physical therapy practice. And, uh, and hence, uh, we are very much within uh, the, our uh, limit of practice uh, where we can uh, do the intravaginal and intrarectal palpation also. So like in all our other physiotherapy patients, history taking is extremely important and carefully listening to the patient. Many of these patients have a lot of emotional component and hence carefully listening to the patient, how they got urinary incontinence, what is their feeling about it is very important. We should also, before we do an evaluation and treatment, we should have an informed written consent from them. This is also extremely important. As far as evaluation is concerned, an external perineal visual observation is the first thing that we do. And then we check the sensation and the reflexes in that area. We also palpate all the pelvic muscles, all the bony landmarks in the pelvic area, the sacrospinous ligaments, all from outside. And also we palpate the external structures and screen them for pain. The perineal body is what I have shown in the diagram, is a very, very important part of the pelvic floor. So we, we test the perineal body, uh, the mobility of the perineal body by asking the patient to do a voluntary pelvic floor muscle contraction. And we observe how the perineal body moves towards the cranium or towards the pubis, yes or no. And then we do ask the patient to do a voluntary pelvic floor muscle relaxation. So it should uh, again come back to its normal level. And then we check for an involuntary pelvic floor muscle contraction or a cough reflex. So we ask the patient to cough and we again watch how well the pelvic floor is contracting by observing the perineal body. And then we ask them to gently bear down and, and during that time, is the pelvic floor able to voluntarily relax, yes or no? We also test the perineal body mobility and descent testing. So perineal descent, for that you ask the patient to bear down actively and strongly. And passive perineal uh, descent is checked by observed in rest. So many of them who have say an organ uh, prolapse, um, uh, they uh, may have a perineal descent, even in rest. Now we come to the vaginal digital internal exam. Of course, we have to take all the precautions of sterile gloves, sterile, uh, uh, your uh, mask, your, your, uh, your, the patient, Everything has to be taken care of, and I will not go into detail of that, but uh, we do a vaginal examination for palpation of the superficial pelvic floor muscle. Also, we palpate the liveta ani, the obturator internus, coccygeus, sacrospinous ligament. So all of these muscles, like how in other uh, field of physiotherapy, 
we palpate the muscle and we come to know a lot about those muscles. Similarly, uh, in pelvic floor exam also, when we touch a muscle, we come to know a lot about those muscles. Your, your breath is very important, uh, as I said before. So when you do a purposeful exhale, normally the pelvic floor muscles should get lifted. And if they are not getting lifted, then probably there's something wrong with the pelvic floor muscles. Of course, internal exam is not recommended if patient complains of dyspareunia, that is difficult or painful sexual intercourse, vaginismus, spasm of the pelvic floor muscles, and history of pelvic trauma. We also do not do an internal exam if uh, the woman is not married and has a not never had a sexual intercourse. Vaginal distal, digital palpation of pelvic floor muscles uh, is very useful examination tool that can be used by us physiotherapists to understand, teach, and give feedback to patients whether they are doing it correctly, whether they are doing it uh, uh, strongly or not. The advantage of such an examination is that we can gauge pelvic floor muscle strength, anatomical changes, symmetry of contraction, whether they are symmetrically on the right side and on the left side, uh, the muscle tone, and as well as all painful areas if they are present. It has a good intra-rater in reliability, but only fair inter-rater reliability because it's more subjective. So normal pelvic floor muscles, let's talk about that. What would be a normal pelvic floor muscle? So a normal pelvic floor muscle can voluntarily and involuntary contract and relax. The voluntary contraction is strong. There should be a squeeze and a lift. Both components are very important. So if you're you doing a digital palpation, uh, you should feel a squeeze around your finger and also a lift towards the pubis. Also, the voluntary relaxation should be complete. There are many people whose pelvic floor muscle is not relaxing enough. Involuntary contraction and relaxation are both present. There is no movement of the pelvis, no contraction of gluteals, nor adductors, nor overuse of abdominals. There should be no breath holding. And there should be a moderate co-contraction of the transversus abdominis, which is acceptable. So pelvic floor muscle assessment using Laycock perfect scale. This is what we do. And what, what is the scale about? So P stands for power of contraction, like our, our other uh, evaluation, zero to five. Endurance, time for which maximum voluntary contraction can be sustained, Repetitions up to 10 of MVCs, fast twitch, number of one second contraction and full relaxation in 10 seconds, elevation, lifting pelvic floor muscle towards pubic bone and head, whether it's present or absent. Co-contraction of transverses is also something that should happen. Timing in involuntary PFM contraction, whether it is present or absent. There is a variety of ways to assess the pelvic floor muscles besides the digital palpation. Manometry and dynamometry provide a more accurate measurement of strength, but real-time ultrasound and internal digital palpation are probably the most widely used in clinical practice as they're the most cost-effective and efficient means of examination. Let's talk now about of the underactive pelvic floor muscles, which is our topic for today. So it has been defined by ICS, International Continent Society, as a situation in which the pelvic floor muscles cannot voluntarily contract when this is appropriate. Symptoms such as urinary incontinence and anal incontinence or pelvic organ prolapse can occur. Signs like no voluntary or involuntary contraction of the pelvic floor muscles can happen. Some causes of underactive pelvic floor muscles. Childbirth, whether it's a vaginal or a cesarean, 
advanced age, high blood body mass index, type 2 diabetes, constipation, chronic constipation, functional constipation, fecal incontinence, genital prolapse, congestive heart failure, use of diuretics, and heavy lifting at work. These are some of the causes of underactive pelvic floor muscles. Now, what happens? So if you see this young boy, if he's uh, watering the plants and he puts his foot on the pipe, the, there will be some water that will still flow in the pipe. Now he puts his foot, he sits on this hammock, okay? So compared to him pressing with his foot on the pipe, the much less water will flow out or no water will flow out. But if he puts his foot on this, uh, stands on the hammock and puts his foot on the pipe, then very little of the water will stop. It will still keep coming. So that's exactly what happens in a weak underactive pelvic floor. That hammock is weak and therefore we cannot stop the water from coming out. Pelvic organ prolapse is defined as the descent of one or more of the following. And the anterior vaginal wall is called the cystocil. The posterior vaginal wall is called rectocil. The uterus, cervix, or the apex of the vagina is called vaginal volt and can occur after hysterectomy. The small intestine is enterocele. So let's take this example of boat at the dock to understand it a little better. So the boat is hanging by the ligaments, the ropes, and, and the boat is the pelvic organ, and below that is the water. As long as the water is fine, the ligaments are, uh, the ropes are fine, so that uh, the boat will have no problem. It will hang very, very comfortably, and it will float in the water. But suppose there's no water. That means the pelvic floor muscles are very weak. The boat will come down and it will stretch the ligaments. At some point, the ligaments will break and the boat will fall. And that's how we get a pelvic organ prolapse. That means the ligaments are not working. The pelvic floor muscles are not working. And so the uh, pelvic organ prolapse occurs. What are the indications of pelvic floor rehab? I want to put this because we have a tremendous scope of practice as a physiotherapist. So we can treat all these different uh, entities like lower urinary tract symptoms, which would, would include urinary incontinence, urinary urgency and frequency, slow or intermittent stream and, and straining, feeling of incomplete straining. And uh, bowel symptoms like obstructed defecation, functional constipation, rectal and or anal prolapse, fecal incontinence, incomplete emptying, and vaginal symptoms like pelvic organ prolapse. So physiotherapy has a great scope. Today, of course, we are not going to talk of all of this. The only, talk, the only topic we've taken today is urinary incontinence. And there's a lot of research that supports pelvic floor muscle training. And I will not go into, there are umpteen research papers on this. So today we will focus on training and underactive pelvic floor. How do we do that? So pelvic floor training is like working on a muscle because these are also regular skeletal muscles and therefore adapt to strength training like other muscles. So when prescribing exercises, it's important to note that pelvic floor muscles, remember, have 70% slow twitch fibers and 30% fast twitch fibers. So slow twitch uh, fibers hypertrophy with exercise training is possible and a little more effort and it's harder to train the fast twitch fibers, but a little more effort would be able to train even the fast twitch fibers. The first component of uh, activating the pelvic floor muscles correctly is the motor learning. It's a cognitive learning. We cannot see the muscles. We cannot, there's not movement. It's not like a biceps muscle, which does a movement. 
So how difficult is that? Is it it's more a motor learning? So the first step to pelvic floor muscle training is to teach a correct pelvic floor muscle contraction. It has three components. As I've told you earlier, squeeze around the pelvic openings, inward or cranial lift of the pelvic floor muscle and lift towards the pubic symphysis. All of these three things should happen for a normal pelvic floor muscle contraction. So what are the things we would like to train the muscle for? Strength training. That means low number of repetition with maximum voluntary contraction. But if we want to train them for endurance, we do high number of repetition with sub-maximum voluntary contraction. This is as good as any of our other muscles. Then the coordination training and the pelvic floor muscle contraction prior to coughing. And I'll talk a little more about it later. Encourage patient to get as close to, ma to maximum contraction as possible using strong verbal encouragement. The patient cannot see the muscle compared to our other outer muscles. And therefore, a lot of strong verbal and, and, uh, encouragement is needed for this patient to achieve what she or she needs to achieve. So what is this knack? A knack was a very beautiful thing coined by James Ashton Miller. It means that as you feel a sneeze or cough coming on, you pull your pelvic floor muscles up and in, and you can do this even before you start lifting. This helps a lot of people who are into uh, into weightlifting, who are into running, uh, or, or even before they cough, if they, they will not leak if they do this. So NAC is a beautiful technique for preventing leakage when an effort is put on the body. We often find that a patient is unable to contract the pelvic floor muscle after even one week of rehearsal on her own or with the help of a physiotherapist. We can then try muscle facilitation technique to stimulate and make them aware of the pelvic floor muscles. So what are some of the methods? A stretch of the pelvic floor muscles, tapping on the perineum um, or, or the pelvic floor muscles or electrical stimulation can also be tried out. Another way, a very interesting way uh, of uh, which Liebergall, uh, Wishnes, uh, I can't pronounce that word anyway, he uh, has recommended and which you can do all of you sitting and watching can do right now. So make a circle with your mouth muscles. And when you do that, you will automatically find that the pelvic floor muscles contract. It's an amazing way of teaching a woman who just doesn't understand what the pelvic floor muscle contraction means. Of course, the above recommendation is, uh, is based on clinical experience and I don't think there's any research on this. How do we progress of pelvic floor muscle contraction? So first, we teach them to contract as, as hard as possible. And we can gauge this by a digital palpation most of the time. And second, second, once they are able to do that, then we tell them to hold the contraction for three to 10 seconds. And third, if they can do that, then we tell them to contract as hard as possible, hold the contraction and add three to four quick contraction for the fast twitch fibers. The fourth stage, we tell them, teach them the knack that is PFM contraction prior to coughing. So all of these stages, one by one, should be achieved by the patient as much as possible. So now the patient can do at least the first three stages. So how do we progress? This is another way of progressing. We can add vaginal cones uh, first without the weights and then with more weights and ask them to stand up, ask them to do their daily activities, depend on what they are able to do, keeping the vaginal cone in the correct place. Are they able to sustain the contraction for longer periods? So also we can shorten the resting periods between the contractions. 
which can increase the speed of the contraction. These are all ways of progressing with the pelvic floor muscle exercise. When increase the number of repetitions, how fast they go into fatigue or they are able to do a lot of repetitions in one go. Also, it's extremely important to exercise pelvic floor muscles in different positions. Uh, otherwise, they will be able to do only in one position, but when you go to other positions, they will not be able to do. So it's extremely important to teach that in different positions. Also, you should have to teach them pelvic floor muscle during workouts. Somebody is doing a Zumba class, and after the Zumba class, she leaks, then she has to be taught first without the movement, and then slowly she should incorporate into her Zumba class. Increase frequency and duration of workouts. Uh, so uh, we can uh, later the workouts get more and more uh, active and uh, yet they are able to control their pelvic floor muscles and they don't leak. Discovery, uh, recovery time, sorry, decrease the recovery time between workouts. This is another way of uh, doing, so they are doing one after the other uh, workout and the in between recovery time is less and less and yet they don't leak. So as I said before, uh, uh, and now there's a question coming up for you, the main component of a pelvic floor muscle are isometric squeeze, a squeeze and a lift, simultaneous co-contraction of the gluteals and adductors, or is it a bulge and a descent? The poll is live for all the attendees. The attendees will be getting another 15 seconds to answer the question. For the people on YouTube Live, please give your answers in the live chat. Another five seconds for the attendees to answer. Mom, the results should be on your screen now. Excellent. I told you from the beginning, I have an excellent audience. They're really, really very, very smart. So squeeze and lift is the perfect answer. And 77% have said it right. Great. Let's talk about the errors. What are the common errors that we do when we work on the pelvic floor muscles? So uh, hollowing or bracing of the whole abdomen inwards. A lot of our patients will when we tell them to contract the pelvic floor muscles, they will hollow or brace the whole abdomen inwards. Of course, uh, this is not correct, but gentle transversus abdominis contraction is normal. They will contract the hip adductors or they will uh, contract the gluteals. We have to check all this. If they're contracting the adductors, we have to check, uh, uh, or they're contracting the gluteals or they're... Uh, Following their abdomen, we have to prevent them. We have to teach them that they don't do this. Many of them will stop breathing and contract the pelvic floor. So if you only check the pelvic floor muscle, it could be working at that time. But are they breathing normally? Yes or no? If they are not breathing normally, then uh, we have to teach them that they have to contract the pelvic floor muscle while they are breathing normally. So many of them will take a deep inspiration and lift up the pelvic floor muscle. This is also wrong. They are supposed to lift the pelvic floor muscle while they are breathing out gently. Many of them strain, they push their perineum towards the caudal direction or towards their feet. This is also wrong. These are all common errors. Okay, another question for the intelligent audience in front of me. It is important for women to continue a pelvic floor muscle maintenance home exercise program. Is that true or is it false? 30 seconds for all the attendees to answer. I request the attendees to answer the poll on the pop-up and not in the chat. The people on the YouTube live, please respond in the live chat. Another five seconds for the attendees to answer.
Ma'am, the result should be on your screen. Oh right? my God, 98%. Yes, unfortunately, yes, that's the correct answer. So yes, we have to do like all our other muscles, they get deconditioned. And uh, these muscles we can't even see. So we don't know uh, what is the state, but only when we start getting the symptoms, we know. So yes, unfortunately, both men and women, in fact, have to do a continuous lifelong home exercise program for maintenance of the pelvic floor muscles. There are not enough studies to indicate the amount of pelvic floor muscle exercises required to maintain the strength, endurance, and coordination of the pelvic floor muscles, but deconditioning is likely to occur. Hence, pelvic floor muscle exercises should be continued at least twice a week the whole life. I want to talk about the bladder habits that lead to dysfunction. Especially this is addressed to young girls who are watching me. So often we are so busy that we delay toileting too long and this will overstretch the bladder leading to atonic bladder. We are out the whole day in college or school and we do not want to use the toilets that are not probably clean or have you been used by other people and we really overstretch and we cause atonicity in the bladder. Hovering over the toilet does not allow adequate relaxation of pelvic floor muscle. This is, this is what often a lot of women do. So they do not sit on the toilet seat and they are half standing position because they are afraid to sit on the toilet seat because it could be, they may get infection. But this, this allows adequate relaxation of the muscles. So they are in a state of contraction at that moment. And then you are expecting them to relax to void. So this is not a good habit. So you can use a sanitizer to clean the toilet seat if necessary, or use an Indian toilet, but do not hover over the toilet. Bearing down to initiate stream on or, in, or complete urination. So, uh, so sometimes we have the habit, okay, I have to go out somewhere and therefore I will, I will bear down and push out whatever urine is there in my bladder. This is not a good idea at all. This another habit, which, is, which I find very common amongst women, they just in case, just in case I will have to uh, travel for two hours and I will not be able to use a toilet and so I must empty my bladder. So I see a lot of women known to me and not known to me. They will often uh, during, uh, say there's a, they, they've come for a program which lasts for four hours or three hours or two hours. They will go and uh, void before the program starts. They will go and void in the interval. They'll go and void after the program ends. Why just in case? To, because they are not able to hold even uh, less amount of uh, urine in the bladder and they're afraid that if they laugh or if they talk loudly, they will lose a little urine. So they just keep voiding often. And this uh, is not a good idea at all because it, it doesn't give, the bladder is the muscle which requires to be stretched. So it doesn't happen. Uh, and so, so slowly their bladder capacity gets less and less and they have to use the restroom more often. Uh, this is especially again for women when they fail to wipe front to back after bowel movements. And this is an education that should be done widely, especially amongst our rural population, but even amongst our urban population. And uh, this, uh, this is a very, very uh, commonly done mistake because of which many women get urinary tract infection often. Let's talk about troubleshooting. So let's, in spite of our best efforts, some patients may have difficulty targeting the pelvic floor muscles specifically to perform exercises. So what do we do? 
we teach them we are not getting it teach them again not getting it again we teach them still they are not able to understand because remember it's a lot of cognitive learning we can use a simple mirror we put a mirror in front of the their own pelvic floor muscles which they can see now and and then when they uh, you tell them to do uh, the contraction because they can visually see the muscle now they are able to do it much better and of course we have sophisticated uh, equipments like biofeedback device and electrical stimulation so e stim uh, to treat urinary incontinence is thought to stimulate pelvic muscle contractions and or modulate detrusor muscle contractions the mode of delivery could be intravaginal or intrarectal electrodes and for improvement of pelvic floor muscle strength high frequency is used and for normalization of detrusor activity which could be hyperactive and we want to normalize it low frequency electrical stimulation is used this is a study an interesting study done uh, by the norwegian physiotherapist and um, uh, uh, it was found that uh, what they did was they took a control group then they took an exercise group and they took a took a group where they give stimulation and then they uh, used cones uh, for treatment of uh, stress urinary incontinence and they found that amongst all the groups the best group was the one that did exercises of course the exercises were taught individually correctly but that's so wonderful so we physiotherapists have a big big role in training women in pelvic floor muscles i earlier talked about the biofeedback biofeedback is a beautiful uh, uh, instrument that we can use for giving feedback to the patient again they visually see on the uh, monitor and 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 hence they they understand okay this is a good contraction this is not such a good contraction and they are able to understand and pick up the exercise much better so uh, biofeedback is is a good adjunct to a uh, pelvic floor muscle training and it increases the proprioceptive and sensory awareness and increases the cortical control over the bladder and pelvic floor muscle which is very important um and hence can be used as an adjunct for pelvic floor muscle training but physiotherapists should always ensure correct pelvic floor muscle contraction by perineal observation and digital palpation um because in many cases verbal instruction is not sufficient to teach the correct technique so what happens you uh, you hook them to the biofeedback machine and you tell them without checking the perineal uh, area or without doing the digital palpation you tell them to contract the pelvic floor muscles and you get a good contraction on the monitor but probably they would be contracting the gluteals the abdominals or the adductors also and then getting the good contraction so you have to ensure that they don't do the wrong contraction what are the kind of these this is very important what are the kind of uh, exercises you do not do if you have a weak uh, pelvic floor muscle of course most of us don't even know whether we have weak pelvic floor muscles or good pelvic until we get symptoms so uh, so uh, what happens is when the intra abdominal pressure increases if you have weak pelvic floor, uh, floor muscles it uh, the uh, the pressure is uh, because of the increase of intra abdominal pressure there's a pressure which pushes the pelvic floor muscles down instead of up they are pushed down and and so these exercises uh, which are wrong uh, should be uh, further weaken the pelvic floor muscles and this is something i have i have come across many many a time when my postpartum women are dying to uh, lose weight dying to make their stomach flat and they go into all kinds of exercises without asking me so yes this is one of them sit ups sit ups increases intra abdominal pressure and therefore if you have a weak uh, you will be in trouble if you have a weak pelvic floor muscle it has to be done in a certain way this is another exercise that it should be avoided if you have a weak pelvic floor 
and this one this exercise and the earlier one actually should be banned because it creates havoc it can give you back problems it can give you uh, it can give you pelvic floor problems so double leg lifts are are an exercise that should not be prescribed by a physical therapist lifting heavy weight if you see her poor poor girl she has leaked while she has lifted this hair. so the weight is too much the intra abdominal pressure increased so much that it pushed down on the pelvic floor and she leaked we we, uh, we see a lot of such leaks in our very active sports and elite sports people running jumping and other high impact exercises can also uh, be avoided or should be avoided if there's a weak pelvic floor and um, and weak pelvic floor uh, it, it, it would uh, cause symptoms of leak so and trampoline is one of the worst things it really can create havoc with the pelvic floor so in, in conclusion i would like to say that pelvic floor muscles most neglected are the most neglected group of muscles those subject to continuous strain throughout life but they yet they are most neglected unfortunately hence the pelvic floor muscles will need regular training to stay healthy throughout life and I'm, i want to give a message to all those who are listening although women are more likely to suffer from urinary incontinence as an after effect of childbirth menopause or aging like any other muscle in the body you can improve it no matter what your age correct pelvic floor exercises should be the first line of treatment for anyone having problems of incontinence preferably learned from a physiotherapist specialized in pelvic floor rehab all truths are easy to understand once they are discovered the point is to discover them galileo galilei thank you so much now we uh, have we... demonstration hello so i am going to show you a few uh, practical demo so this is uh, mamta she came to me uh, about a month back um, with the complaint her chief complaint was urinary incontinence so when i took the history i came to know that she had delivered uh, four months earlier and uh, she um, uh, started doing exercises after three months of her delivery she had a normal full term delivery she had no urinary incontinence during her pregnancy uh, and uh, during her uh, Mamta, during or before conception, also she never had any problem, right? So she had never had any problem, but since the last one month, she started getting urinary incontinence. So um, uh, she came to me with this chief complaint. So I asked her that what is different about your present life, and she said that uh, I have been I have started exercising since the last one month. and after that i started getting this leak so uh, i asked her what exercises have you been doing can you show me so can you show me mamta what exercises have you been doing so just observe her abdominal area when she does this crunch yes mamta just do it once more okay yeah okay So did you observe how her abdomen bulges out when she does the crunch, and then she also did another exercise, right, Mamta? Yeah. Only the leg, only the leg. Yeah. And down. Okay. So she did these kind of exercises, and all of these exercises increased her intra-abdominal pressure, as I'll be talking, and that probably caused, and probably her pelvic floor muscles are. Um, she has never exercised her pelvic floor muscles before, so her pelvic floor muscles are probably weak after the delivery. She had a normal vaginal delivery. This was the first baby, of course, but um, that would probably be the cause. That is what I thought. so she uh, i examined her i uh, i examined her uh, perineal area 
and I found that there was a little parental consent. And then I also did with a written consent uh, internal palpation of the pelvic floor muscles. And when I told her to squeeze hard against my digit, she could not squeeze very hard. It was just a two. That means it was a weak contraction and there was no lift of the pelvic floor muscles. Uh, so I uh, uh, started her on an exercise program. The first thing that I did was I showed her uh, what is a correct pelvic floor muscle contraction. So uh, the, we talked about the uh, various uh, factors of the uh, of a correct pelvic floor muscle uh, contraction. So that's what I made her do. And uh, it took me almost 10 days for her to understand what the pelvic floor muscle contraction after I used the biofeedback. And then she understood it. So, and then she started doing the correct pelvic floor muscle exercise um, with digital palpation. Uh, now it's been almost a month and she uh, has been doing the, uh, the correct pelvic floor muscle exercise and we have progressed now. So now, uh, can you bend your knees? Yes. Now, uh, can you pull up your pelvic floor muscle while you breathe out, and then you lift your arms up at, at, while doing normal breathing. So there are a few things that you keep in mind. You should not tighten your hip muscle. You should not hollow or pull in your abdomen. You should not take your eyes towards each other and you should not stop breathing. So pelvic floor muscle exercise, that means the contraction, without any of these, while you are counting and while you are moving your arms, okay? So as you breathe out, pull up your pelvic floor muscle, and now, while you are doing normal breathing and counting aloud, please count aloud, both hands up. Yes, please count aloud. Very good, Mamta is counting aloud. Okay. Excellent. Now, slowly keeping the pelvic floor muscle tight, bring your arms down. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So, uh, in the COVID era, of course, I don't touch the patients. So, uh, she could do uh, the exercise. And uh, I have seen her before the COVID began. Uh, and, uh, and she could do it at that time. And she's now doing a home exercise program. Some of the exercises that were taught before the COVID era. Uh, now, Mamta, can you pull in the pelvic floor muscle again and, and take your knee, your left knee to that side, holding on to the pelvic floor muscle, but continuing to breathe normally and to ensure uh, to me that you're breathing normally. I want you to count. One, two, three, one second, one count. Okay, so breathe out, pull in your pelvic floor, and now take your left knee to the side while you are counting aloud. Yes, I can hear her counting aloud. She is counting aloud. Excellent, please. And then now. Ten. 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 Okay, so this is necessary and I forgot to wear it. Okay. Yeah, so she did this bend knee fall out also with the pelvic floor muscles activated. And there was another exercise that we did, Mamta. Uh, we are uh, we, we holding onto the pelvic floor muscle, straightening, sliding your uh, right left leg along the bed. So we do that next, okay? So uh, uh, gently, while breathing out, pull in your pelvic floor, and now keeping that pelvic floor activated, slide your left leg along the bed, so, and she's counting aloud, so I know she's doing all the breathing. Excellent, when you can't hold on to your pelvic floor, don't go any further, and start coming back, keeping holding on to your pelvic floor. She should not do any pelvic movement like a posterior pelvic tilt also. So these were the three exercises that I taught you in this, this position. 
Then I taught you an exercise that in the sitting position, two exercises in the sitting position, yes. right? So can we uh, have you do that, please? <laughs> Okay, for this, uh, this is an exercise which I taught her, uh, and I put this towel, if you can see that. Uh, can you see it? That's it. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so uh, so this is, and then she sits on it, Mampa sits on it. Yeah, and now when she's sitting on it, she can feel her perineum touching the towel, so it gives a good proprioceptive feedback. Uh, Mamta, now, while uh, you are breathing out, I want you to lift the part from where you deliver off the tongue. Yeah, gently. So while you breathe out, gently lift the uh, uh, perineum or the part from where you deliver off the tongue. And then gently relax as you breathe in. One more time. Gently breathe while breathing out. Lift the perineum on the pelvic floor area of the towel. And now she's counting because she can hold it. She has been practicing hard here in the COVID area. Good girl. And now relax. Great. Very nice. Okay. That was good. Okay. We also did a step to stand exercise, right? Okay. So we'll do, we'll do that now. Okay, so now, uh, so Vamba is going to uh, sit down. So while she stands up, she is going to tighten the pelvic floor muscles and uh, and keep them tightened and elevated while she stands up. Okay, so breathe out, pull in your pelvic floor and stand up while holding the pelvic floor up and doing normal breathing. That is very good, Vamba. And now, again, uh, keep the pelvic floor tightened as you sit down. It's an eccentric contraction now of the pelvic floor. When she stands up, it's a concentric contraction. When she sits down, it's an eccentric contraction. Again, once more, pull in your pelvic floor. Yes. You feel your pelvic floor. Good. And now stand up. That is very good. And now, Keep your pelvic floor again pulled in as you sit down. So as she sits, her pelvic floor gets stretched, but she can control it. Great. Thank you so much, Mamta. Uh, now we will have somebody else, uh, a very young, sweet girl, Anishita. <laughs> So this is Nishika, a 21-year-old girl who loves to run. So she takes part regularly in marathons. She has been running in fact for one year now, but since uh, uh, but, uh, since about uh, I think it was in February that when you went for your was it in January? January when she went for the run, she uh, started experienced weeks. Um, so uh, again, she came to me, and uh, we, we had to sort out a problem because she couldn't stop running. Of course. So um, I we will not do an internal exam for her, and we uh, so I taught her pelvic exercises, and uh, and she progressed pretty well. Yeah. So the first exercise that was taught to her was. Um, um, and your knees, yes. Yeah. So, so, so her uh, problem of urinary incontinence was more a uh, stress incontinence because she got the incontinence only when she had. She had no other problem at any other time. So uh, we started doing, of course, the, the slow pitch fibers first. The slow pitch fibers. So, Nishika, um, uh, when you breathe out, put in your pelvic floor in this position. This is how we started on day one. And we did and relax a little bit. Then we started the counting. So 
we now put in the pelvic flow and now start counting. So she's counting now, and she can count normal breathing. She can maintain the pelvic floor. Relax. Okay, so she is able to do this. So the second thing was that I, I told her to squeeze as hard as you can and, and, and then start counting. So breathe out, pull in your pelvic floor as hard as you can and start counting. Excellent. And since uh, she could do the uh, slow twitch fibers so well, I thought I would introduce the fast twitch fibers. So Vishika, uh, uh, you first squeeze your pelvic floor as hard as you can, okay? And then you count. And then after that, I want you to do fast contractions of the pelvic floor, okay? One second, one contraction. And see how many you can do. Three, four, how many can you do? So first, we now put in your pelvic floor. And, and now relax. And now do the fast contractions. This she is not doing perfectly. I think we have to train for this. But yeah, it is a little difficult. And of course, now she has stopped running because of the COVID. But uh, so we don't know whether she would think or not. But this fast contractions is something uh, we have to look into uh, for her. But this is how you do it. Okay. There are other exercises that we did for stroke uh, fibers, so split fibers, right? So can you get into all four positions now? Okay, so I taught us, and I told you that we do all different positions. So this was a position. Uh, this is one of the positions I taught her exercises in. So uh, uh, now, Abhishika, while you breathe out, pull in your pelvic floor and breathe in and relax. Okay. Now you can't do any other part of the body except your left arm, which you are going to lift up and bring it down. Okay, so breathe out, activate your pelvic floor, and now lift your left arm up as you do normal breathing and as you count. Okay, excellent. One, two, hold, hold on to the pelvic floor. Okay. Excellent. Okay, now the other one was pulling in the pelvic floor and sliding your leg. Okay, so you slide your left leg so the audience can see. Okay, so breathe out while breathing out, pull in your pelvic floor and now slide your left leg along the bed. Very good. While doing normal breathing, very good. So now we are talking of endurance, we are talking of control. And we are talking of strength. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Now we will challenge her a little more by asking her to uh, opposite hand and leg you lift at the same time while you keep up and lift your uh, tightened. Yes? Yes, Ashishika? Okay. So uh, we will uh, lift the left the hand and the right leg. So while breathing out, tighten your pelvic floor muscles, and now lift your left leg and your right uh, left uh, sorry your right leg and your left hand. When you feel you can't hold on to your pelvic floor, please come back. So she's getting a fairly good control of her pelvic floor now. Then she's, uh, she's a young girl, so she wanted to do something more energetic. This was too slow for her. So uh, uh, we, we also did the planks, right? Okay, so get into the plank position. Okay. 
So right now, when you're doing the plan, you should keep your pelvic floor muscle tightening. Do you feel that muscle tightening? Because a lot of people do the plank because they have a lot of strength in their arms, strength in their legs, but they don't feel the pelvic floor muscle tightening. Then it's of no use. You have to feel the core or the inner muscles tighten. Do you feel that? And you can hold for quite a, some time. You can always increase the time for hold. Excellent meditation. And we do one more now. We do the side plank. Okay, and you should feel the pelvic floor muscle tightening. Yes, darling? Can you feel it? Yes, good. And she can hold it for quite a few seconds. Excellent. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that's the end of my practical demo today. Is there anything that uh, else that you have to do? No. Thank you so much, Ishika. Thank you. Ma'am, shall I move back to the laptop screen? Yes. Thank you so much, ma'am, for such an informative and insightful webinar. And also the practical demonstration that you did give us a lot, gave us a lot of information on how, on how practically the therapist needs to command, give commands to the patient and also how we can incorporate all the pelvic floor exercises into so many exercises that you all showed to us. Because generally what happens in most of the clinics is that only the pelvic floor exercises are taught to the patient and all these exercises are not incorporated along with the uh, other exercises. So ma'am, we have lot number of questions awaiting for you. And... And ma'am, uh, is the uh, discussion over now? Is this? Sorry? Ma'am, uh, uh, ma would you like to share a screen or shall we go ahead for the question and answer session? Uh, no, question and answer now. Okay, I'd ask Dr. Adhe to please start with the question and answer session. Yes. So uh, ma'am, we have lot number of questions, more than hundreds of questions. So the first question that we have is that what other challenges have you personally faced in grading the PFM while performing internal examination? Sorry, can you say, I understood the internal examination, but what yeah. else do you say? It is what other challenges have you personally challenges. faced in grading challenges? Have you personally faced in grading the PFM while performing internal examination? <laughs> Oh, yes. A lot of challenges in terms of women not willing to do. Doctors not happy, gynecologists, all other surgeons, etc. Oh, physiotherapists, this may be gaya kya? So a lot of challenges, yes. And they're still going on. There's no end to the challenge. And of course, the women. The women don't want to, uh, you know, uh, strip in front of us. They don't want to, in spite of giving them the best uh, sort of a treatment and uh, comfortable environment, they still do not want us to examine. So yes, but once they have, we have talked to them. So, so very often I would take quite a few sessions with them and not do any internal palpation at all. Okay. But once they become very comfortable with us, then when they uh, realize that we, we are fine people and everything is very safe, everything is secure, the, room of, the door of the room should be locked, uh, you can have your assistant in the room, but the room should be locked. They should have complete privacy. Nobody should go come in and out of that room. And once they are very comfortable with us, then they allow us to do, because without the in internal digital palpation, like all other muscles of the body, it is almost impossible for us to make out what is the status of the pelvic floor muscles. All right. So the key is privacy and making the patient comfortable because obviously it's the pelvic floor that we're examining. Right, ma'am? Hello? Yes. Yeah. So I move on to the next question, which is why can't we do internal examination with this periunia or if the patient is unmarried? Uh, we, we don't... Uh, this perunia. Uh, if dyspareunia, did you say? 
yes ma'am and or if the patient is unmarried yeah if the patient is unmarried we do not want to do any internal examination obviously for obvious reasons if she has dyspareunia that's painful sex then we have to also be very careful we have to find out what are the causes what are the reasons even and it's a lot of emotional uh, involvement so uh, again we have to make the patient much more comfortable and we do not we never increase their pain so we have to be very slow and very careful about an internal exam we may never do an internal exam for a patient who has dyspareunia all right fine ma'am um the next question which we have is can we use perfect score for male patients also there are a very few literature on male incontinence so how do we go with male incontinence yes i'm very glad for this question okay. yes a lot of people have uh, have um, uh, males have incontinence and we don't talk about it today also i have not really uh, i have only made a passing reference to that i have not uh, mentioned it too much but yes a lot of people especially after prostate surgery they have uh, incontinence or because of aging they have incontinence even their pelvic floor muscles so if i have to do a internal uh, is that is that also the part of the question if i have to do an internal exam for a male have they asked that then i have to do via the rectal rectal examination so rectal examination and uh, um, our we, we have been trained in that there are uh, you know specific trainings in that and uh, mm -hmm. we can make them like prone and we do a rectal palpation internal palpation and we can make out the pelvic floor muscle status all right uh, fine ma'am so uh, one of the participants has also asked i think it's an interesting question uh, should we drink water after urination or before urination does it have any connection with good bladder training Ma'am, if you could throw some light on this. Okay, I don't think it's before or after. It's throughout the day. We should drink water. Water is uh, never has any side effects. Uh, so at least eight glasses of water is recommended per day for everybody. So the uh, I'm very glad for this question again because a lot of women, if they are going out or if they are going to travel, will not drink water yes, because they're afraid they will not be able to control their voiding. and therefore they will not drink water it's a very bad habit we must drink water throughout the day and not uh, prevent us ourselves from drinking water just because we are afraid that we will leak urine so we have to treat our pelvic floor muscles instead of avoiding to drink water okay fine ma'am and i think this question is would be in the minds of many people that is there a different protocol or a different approach for treatment of stress and urge incontinence or is it the same do we have to go about the same treatment for both kinds of incontinence or it is different so basically stress incontinence is uh, when you are uh, putting in an effort or you're coughing or you are laughing right so yes, we have to so we have to uh, maybe they, these people we treat the nac technique uh, much more emphasis on the nac technique uh, which i talked about before and for uh, the people who are urge incontinence we we tell them to delay going to the washroom it's a lot to do with the mind also so control try to control and stop the voiding uh, and and delay and slowly what happens they they the pelvic floor muscles are contracting and they can delay the voiding and they don't have to run to the uh, bathroom or the washroom so fast that's so that's very really important yeah. Yeah. yes ma'am inside of course we train the pelvic floor yeah. muscles in both so uh, ma'am one of the other questions which we have is that is there a difference in the probability of urinary incontinence after a cesarean section and a vaginal childbirth there's a lot of controversy about it and uh, yes uh, uh, unfortunately literature does show a little less incidence of uh, urinary incontinence after a c section compared to a vaginal delivery but uh, but if that, that should not be a reason for a c section uh, you know selective c or or only reason for a c section okay yes I there know. is probably a, there is a little bit of difference in the number of people who have urinary incontinence or vaginal little more than a c section 
Uh, Ma'am, there are a lot number of questions which I can see, but due to paucity of time, uh, we'll stick to the last question for now. Uh, the last question is that I uh, there is a uh, participant who is saying that I have had a few challenging cases of vaginismus of different cause, but getting the PFM to relax was a challenge. Is there a specific technique you suggest to follow? Yeah, so we use the dilator today. The topic is not that. So, uh, so we use the dilators and uh, we uh, gradually uh, help them uh, with, uh, with the vaginismus. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Right. So that was all for the questions. And thank you so much, ma'am, for such an insightful and informative webinar. And I, there were a uh, complete uh, thousand participants were hooked up for the entire hour. And the practical demonstration which you gave was a cherry on the top because I also learned and along with other participants that how exactly we need to give commands to our patients, which is difficult in case of teaching <coughs> floor exercises to them. So that's how uh, we got to learn so much. And uh, there were so many questions on YouTube also, but obviously due to um, lack of time, we couldn't ask. And ma'am, if you uh, would like to give your email address for the questions, uh, because there are a lot number of questions, so you can share your email address. Otherwise, how do I give it? Ma'am, you can just speak it loud. What, uh, if they... It's uh, drsnimehta at gmail.com. Right. So if at all uh, you want to ask your questions, your queries, you can just drop a mail to ma'am's email ID. And ma'am, thank you so much for the insightful webinar. And it and was a great learning hour. Okay. I would like to thank you, Adya. You've been really wonderful, excellent. As I said, chip of the old block. And, uh, and I would like to thank Tanmay. Tanmay is our technical expert. But he's super expert. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, uh, Dr. Deepak Kumar, who is the man behind the whole scene. And it was such a pleasure to come on the screen with all of you. Thank you so Hi. much. Thank, thank you, you so much, ma'am. And, and thank, thank you for all the audience for joining, joining this wonderful, wonderful webinar. webinar. It was a pleasure, pleasure to have you all. I would like to thank ma'am and our moderator, Dr. Adya Kumar, for such a wonderful session. Uh, to all, all the attendees who are still there, there, we are launching the feedback poll. I'd request you to please fill the feedback poll before you exit. This will help us in uh, planning our future webinars, what the physios want, and would also let us know what is the best in the interest for the physiotherapy community. I would also like to tell on Friday, that is 22nd of May. Dr. Deepak Kumar will be having a live webinar on the topic of uh, sacroiliac joint. I request all the attendees, you will be getting the link in your emails and after you leave the webinar as well. So you may register for that. And I thank all the attendees on, on the, the YouTube, YouTube platform, platform for joining us today. today. If, if anyone, anyone wishes to register, register for the webinar, webinar on Friday, Friday the, the link is bit.ly, that is bit.ly slash sij 22 may. I have also shared the link in the chat box. I, I once again, again thank all, all the attendees, attendees for joining us. us. Thank you so much, Sunny, and thank you to all the attendees.